Welcome to the Everything Music Ed podcast. I'm your host, Tom Borning. In this podcast, we'll hear from educators, musicians, composers, conductors, and others about their experiences in learning, teaching, and performing music. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram to find out about upcoming episodes, and be sure to subscribe and follow and rate the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. If you have any questions, suggestions, or show ideas, or maybe you just want to tell me how sexy my voice sounds, uh, please feel free to email me at everythingmusiced at gmail.com. In today's podcast, we talk to the conductor of the President's Own Marine Band, Colonel Jason Fettig. We discuss how he was a clarinet player in the band and what that audition process looked like and how he became to be conductor of the group. He offers some suggestions to educators and how they might go about conducting their students. And we also discuss his new position as head of bands at the University of Michigan. We also talk about some memorable performances he has had and much more. I hope you enjoy Colonel Jason Fettig. Are you still you still uh, got your president's own job right now or what? Yeah, so I'm going to finish out my time here for the rest of the year. I'll be finishing up in December and the concerts the Marine Band is uh, doing at the Midwest Clinic in December will be my last as director. Then I'll retire and I'll start teaching at the University of Michigan in January. Oh my gosh. Well, we'll get into that. Are you do do you still do you still play racquetball at all? <laughs> no, I don't play racquetball anymore. The most I've done is I played ping pong most of the summer with my my sons who were staying with me uh, while my rest of my family moved to Ann Arbor. Oh, I think I saw that. Your one of your sons is going to Swarthmore. Yeah, that's my oldest. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Uh, the thing I remember most about that school is like they make you take a swim test. Am I right about that? I, I think that is correct. Yeah. It's got some unique uh, qualities. And one of the other things is that your laundry is included in your tuition. So that helps justify the high cost of the, <laughs> of the education. I, I do remember that too, actually. Uh, that's yeah. really funny. I I enjoyed that whole. So I, that's your, your oldest son. It... Yep. So he's going to be a sophomore. Wow. And then your youngest son, how old is he? And my youngest son's a twin, so I have boy-girl oh, wow. twins. They're 15, so they're going into their sophomore year in high school. So they're they're not super happy with us to leave after oh. one year of high school and go to a brand new town. But we're we're making progress. Oh, wow. It's turning oh, out okay. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. I can't even imagine. Well, anyways, yeah. I am here with an old friend, Jason Fettig. Uh, I'm so happy you came on, and I appreciate it very much. Um. I used to kill Jason at racquetball regularly. It's just for, so everybody knows that it was, uh, um, <laughs> actually you, you were, you were a very good opponent. Every now and then you'd beat me. You were good. You were good. You're a good player. Lefty. You were taller, taller and stronger than I was. So that's automatically unfair when you have a wider wingspan. <laughs> Uh, it's, I know in your, for your listeners, it's a little scary to be stuck in a glass room with Tom Borning. So you have to watch out. <laughs> So, um, tell me about your earliest memories of music education and how music got was in your life. Well, you know, I started playing clarinet pretty young. You know, most kids start in fourth grade and they have the parade of instruments and they choose what they want to do. I uh, had a, a musical mom and she wanted me to start playing earlier and so uh, gave me a choice of a few instruments when I was in second grade. And I picked the clarinet because it was black, and black was my favorite color. That was it. I'd never heard the instrument. It wasn't one of these stories where if you're a trumpet player and you heard some great recording and you're like, I want to do that. I want to play trumpet. Nope. Had no idea what the clarinet sounded like, but I got one for Christmas and started messing around with it. Got private lessons right away, which was very lucky for me, and and I took to it. So I, I uh, started playing. My fingers are barely enough 
uh, big enough to cover the holes. I remember that, and I rested the clarinet on my knee because it was about as tall as I was. But I really enjoyed playing. Um, it felt natural to me, and having a chance to study music with a private teacher right away and one that I loved so much and somebody I'm still in touch with to this day, all these years later, I think Who's was that? the key to me. Uh, Carlene Delova is her name. Yeah. Man so Manchester, she, New uh, Hampshire. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where you grew up, yeah? This was in Derry. Oh, okay. This would have been in Derry, so, so close to Manchester. But yeah, southern New Hampshire. And Carlene's a saint. She's just such a sweet person, and, and we stay, stay in touch uh, to this day. So yeah, so then I started playing in bands, and uh, I was lucky enough when I was in elementary school to play in the middle school band because I was a little more advanced. And then when I was in the middle school, I played in some high school groups. So I was always around musicians that were better than me, and that was such a joy to be able to hear what it could be, to have that example, and to have great teachers who gave me those opportunities to do some unique things. So that's where it started, and then it caught fire for me, and I never changed, never played another instrument, always stuck with clarinet, and took it all the way through college. Wow. Um, so when, when did you know you wanted to go into music, like in college? Well, it's an interesting thing. I didn't choose to be a music major until my senior year in high school. So even though it was a central part of my identity, and I definitely loved doing it, I had other aspirations. I, at one point, I was going to be a helicopter pilot. I thought medicine was interesting. I was interested in history. And so I think it was just going through that, the motions as a, as a kid, as a student, thinking, what, could I, what am I going to be? You know, what is my life going to be like? Am I gonna, what am I going to do for a living? How am I going to make money? And it wasn't until my senior year when I was, you know, I just had some really emotional, important experiences through music the last couple of years of high school. And I thought, gosh, I can't imagine not doing this. And that's when I also thought, I also think that it would be wonderful to teach this. You know, whether I end up playing professionally, teaching would always be a part of what I wanted to do and, and, and pay it back, you know, share some of those experiences that I had with my teachers and, and inspire the next generation. That was definitely instilled in me. That was the motivation for eventually deciding to do it for a living. I did go to college, though, not sure where I was going to end up, whether I was going to teach band, would have loved to have been a band director, high school band director, whether I was going to play clarinet professionally, whether I was going to go into conducting, wasn't sure. I left that open. I just knew it was going to be in music in some way. All right. So when you went to college, you just were you a music ed major or what was your major when you first went to UMass? Yeah, I went to UMass to be music ed. So I started music ed fully intending to go teach. And, you know, you and I both went to school together. You knew that it was a relatively small department, but there were a lot of opportunities to play in the large ensembles. Uh, we all essentially were doing performance major stuff, even as music ed majors. And so my teacher, Mike Sussman at the time said that he felt like my clarinet playing was good enough that I should add a performance major to get those extra experiences, to do the extra recitals and just, you know, keep my standard as high as I could. It was going to benefit me either way, whether I was going to teach and conduct it, being the best musician and player I could be was going to make me a better teacher. And if there was a chance that I could win an audition somewhere, if I decided to go that way, then having those that extra uh, push was going to be helpful. So I added it after my freshman year, and I ended up having enough credits where I actually got two bachelor's degrees, which I'm proud to say. So instead of a double major, it's two separate degrees. I got them hanging on my wall here oh, in my that's office. That's cool. Did you, did you ever student teach? So you student taught then? I did. Yeah, I did. I student taught. I, I ended up, and we'll get here, but I ended up winning my my position as a player in the Marine Band the year after my coursework was done or the summer after my coursework was done, summer of 97. But I hadn't student taught yet because I took a, I was on the four and a half year plan. Yeah, sure. So I did four years of coursework. So I, at that point, I didn't know what to do, but the Marine Band, before I reported for duty, they said I could finish my degree and finish my student teaching. So I went to student teaching Lexington, Mass, oh, with a, student yeah. teaching middle school. Oh, okay. Having already known that I was going to end up in the Marine Band after that, but it was a great semester because I had fantastic kids, had a great experience, but I didn't have to worry about looking for a job or worrying where I was going to end up teaching or having to go out of state or any of those things. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so that, that was sort of going to be my next question because I was wondering, I didn't 100% know the timeline of when you auditioned. So, so I guess a lot of people want to know what that process is like. Is it... From what you understand, from what I understand, a, 
um, auditioning for the president's own is very similar to auditioning for an orchestra. Is it like behind a screen and everything or? It is. It's really, it's very similar to what you would experience in a professional orchestra. And it's on purpose. It's modeled that way. So the first two rounds are anonymous. They are behind a screen. So you go in and you play in the first round. I played, and it's still this way to this day, I played about five minutes worth of music, four, three, four, five excerpts, depending on how long they were. And that's it. You know, you have that that little snapshot to show that you can make it past that round and you've got the fundamental skills to to potentially be successful in the organization. And then after that, we whittle it down. They whittled it down to, uh, I think, five finalists from what was probably 75 initial candidates, five or six finalists, and went back in. And the second round was also behind a screen, but a little bit more extensive, a little bit more feedback from the committee asking for things to be changed, uh, trying some different uh, ways of playing things. And then the final round, the screen came down. In between there, what we add in in our process is an interview um, because we have to get a security clearance. We have to be enlistable in the Marine Corps. So beyond the musical requirements, there are so many other things that are important for bringing people into the president's own. So that interview is a big part of that. We also have to be within weight standards. So, uh, you know, I got weighed and made sure that we met all of the criteria aside from playing the clarinet. And once you pass that gauntlet, then we did the final round and it was like a half an hour of playing and a lot of different types of music. At that point, it became clear to me that I was potentially in the running to win this job, which was a surprise to me because I went to the audition with zero expectations that I was qualified to play in this organization. So you could have knocked me over with a feather when you told me that, uh, that I won that job back way back then. That's incredible. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm assuming that's the first the first thing you ever auditioned for like a serious i mean you didn't audition for any uh, orchestras or anything did you no later on i did but this was my first professional audition the only other audition i took to had consequence outside of school was for the american wind symphony which was where i was the summer that i won the marine band audition and frankly it's probably why i won the marine audition because I was playing with the American Wind Symphony, which is an amazing group of college students. We toured for three months all around the the eastern seaboard, playing really hard music every night. I was in great shape. I was probably in the best shape of my life, coming off of my education at UMass, going into a job where I was playing regularly. And then when I had that audition a couple weeks later after I finished that tour um, for the Marine Band, I could not have played any better. And there was no pressure either because I didn't really feel like I was qualified. I didn't need a job because I was going to go teach and happily so. So I, I, I was basically playing with house money when I auditioned for the Marine Band. And, and I, I ended up, I remember to this day, I had a great day. I mean, I, would, I don't think I could have played any better. And it just happened to be lightning in a bottle at the right time. Um, but that was my first professional audition. How lucky did I get at 22 to win my first audition and then have it end up being my entire career uh, leading up to what I do now? I'm just super blessed to have that work out the way it Amazing. did. That, that's, oh, that's incredible. You know, I remember we all knew, and I think Bill Rowell knew, and we all knew that you were pretty special. You're a really good musician and... Um, but it's really it's it's really fun. I I, I know I speak for a bunch of uh, UMassians. It's really fun to uh, to see you uh, in front of that band, man. It's really cool. Um, so when did you? How long did you play in it? And then when? How long have you been conductor? Well, first of all, let me say thank you um, that to have all my friends and my colleagues around the country have had that faith in me when I didn't have that faith in myself. You know, you, you go, we go to school together and we had our, our little community and we did some really amazing things at UMass and under Bill Rowell and under our teachers and you study with Walter Chestnut and just to have those mentors and have that magical time at UMass and the music we were making. But we didn't, did any of us really know how that stacked up with what was happening around the rest of the country? Did any of us really have a, an accurate sense of how we were as players and as musicians to people at Eastman or on the West Coast? It's really interesting until you get out in the world, you don't really have a litmus test for whether or not you really have what it takes to play at the highest level and in the greatest ensembles. And so, you know, I always tried to remember that. I always tried not to get too big for my britches. And and really that, that Marine Band audition was the first time that I ever felt like, oh my word, I actually might be able to do this for a living. 
And that was a great feeling, but it was scary up until that point to not really know. I played in the band for three and a half years. So I came into the band in 1997 and I played until 2001, and um, which was not very long. It was a little bit of an unusual situation for me to have the opportunity to then audition to be one of the conductors and the assistant director. And again, it was a situation where I was woefully unqualified to do that, but I was encouraged to just throw my hat in the ring because you never know what can happen, as illustrated by my previous audition. And also, I didn't know it at the time, but they were also trying to find future leadership for the band, trying to put someone in a position where they could be groomed, they could be trained, um, and be there for a very long time. I, I just thought I was kind of greasing the skids for maybe getting a job conducting the band 10 years from now. Um, so I took that audition again with no expectations. And for whatever reason, they chose me and I won that audition. And so I stopped playing clarinet after three and a half years and I started conducting the band. Talk about being shot out of a cannon. You go from just feeling lucky enough to be in a professional organization as a clarinetist, which I had been doing for 20 years, to then conducting really my very first professional ensemble and having it be one of the best bands in the world. Uh, I was too dumb to know to be as scared as I should have been at that point. <laughs> I mean, I'm scared. Like, uh, you know, we I I I conduct a band on the Cape called the Cape Cod Concert Band, and uh, there's uh, when I started conducting the group a couple years ago, I brought in a bunch of music educators. So, you know, every time I'm up in front of them, you know they're judging me, and it, you know, like, and you're like conducting some of the best musicians band musicians in the world and it's like you gotta be like yeah. oh screw that one up <laughs> like I, I you know like oh, could have made that cue a little better you know what i like it's gotta be i can just imagine um that's gotta be it weighs on me a little bit and it's like it would be like even more if it was in front of you know the caliber of musicians that you're in front of well i think one of the things that's beautiful about the marine band is that we take our leaders from within so the directors of the band, by and large, have played in the band. They were colleagues with all of the people who they then lead, not only as conductors, but as officers, which is another layer to that. And so there was a real sense of support. It wasn't an antagonistic situation where you've got this young person who's inexperienced, perhaps a bit naive, coming from outside. And you're like, who's this kid? You know, it was I was one of them. I was I was their colleague already. So and and my success was their success. So. I got a lot of mentorship in those early years. I was nervous and scared and worried about projecting the right balance of humility and understanding that I didn't really know what I was doing yet, but also trying to be confident so I could build more confidence. But that process was actually really informative and educational for me because that's what leadership is. Leadership is finding that balance between humility and confidence and never swaying too far in either direction where you become ineffective. And so the fact that I didn't know what I was doing and I needed help and I needed mentorship and I needed to get better fast was a great training to set the foundation for my leadership philosophy years and years later. I mean, I still think about that. I'm much more confident now in many ways than I was, of course, 20 years ago. But I still make mistakes and I still you know, get nervous and have anxiety about decisions and about my abilities with this high caliber group of people. So I just remember what it felt like back then, and I just try to lay over the top of that my experiences. And then I can bolster myself up and realize that I've had enough success to do it again. But if I had not had that experience, I perhaps would be a bit more uh, oblivious as a leader now and as a conductor to where my shortcomings are and where I do need to lean on the experts and lean on the people who know how to do their jobs better than I do. So I'm thankful for that process, as scary as it was and as nerve-wracking as it still can be to be up in front of 150 of the best musicians in the world. I'm a, correct me if I'm wrong. So now since this is like your 25th year, like 25 years, you can retire from from uh, a military service. Is that – am I right or fix me? No, you're right. Uh, 20 years is the minimum age of retirement. So once I hit 20 years of service, which was – Six years ago now, five years ago now, I could have retired. Um, I had just become the director three years prior to that. So it was important for me to um, stay beyond that retirement eligibility to kind of um, 
you know, set the agenda that we had for this chapter of the band and to make sure that my succession plan was set too, that the people that were going to be director after me were ready to go and that we had a good plan for the leadership uh, beyond my tenure. And so, uh, but yeah, so, I, but after 20 years, I'm, I'm basically again, playing with house money. So I could have retired at any time. And because I'm young enough, I mean, I'm a fairly young director comparatively to some of my predecessors. I could actually stay for quite a, quite a number of years more but I knew I was never going to, to do that. I mean, I think it's really important not to overstay your welcome and your effectiveness in a position like this, because not only are we the directors, the people who hold this position, you know, set the artistic direction of the organization, but I, you know, I'm a Colonel of Marines. I'm the commanding officer of this unit. And I really have a say over every aspect of my colleagues' lives, their promotions, their, um, their opportunities, their upward mobility, to some degree, you know, their relationships with their families, because, you know, we're in the Marine Corps and we do what the Marine Corps asks of us. People do what their officers, officers ask of them. And after a while, being under the thumb of, of one person in our military system can, can really be a problem. And so I think we have to be sensitive in, in leadership to not stay so long that we, we ruin the ability for people to feel like they can move in a different direction. And I think we've done a really good job in the Marine Band of not overstaying our welcome as leaders, you know, doing some good work, putting the band in a better place than where we found it, and then handing that off to the next person to do new and creative things that we would not have thought of. And that's where we are now, as I'm reaching the end of my tenure, I'm very proud of what we've done in the band under the nine, nine and a half years that I've been in command. And I'm thrilled to be able to hand it off to, to, my, uh, to my successor and watch what he's going to do with the band in the years to come. So how did how did the University of Michigan job come about? Did it was it like did did they contact you or did you did you know there was a job opening and you're like, hmm, that's interesting? No, they did not contact me. I mean a job like the University of Michigan or the United States Marine Band uh does not need people to come uh does not need to be invited, inviting people to come. You know, it's such an amazing, prestigious place, both of these institutions. And this position that Mike Haithcock has held for 22 years is one of the most coveted positions in, in higher ed and in our band community. It's just such a fabulous, historic program filled with amazingly talented students. It's an incredible faculty. Think about how many of our teachers at UMass came from University of Michigan. I, it was yeah. more than 50%. Absolutely. I mean, I mean it's, been, it's been one of the elite programs and training grounds for musicians for a century. Uh, and, and there's such a legacy. We heard about it so much from Bill Rowell. I mean, just hearing about his time with Ravelli and the formative years of his education and how that experience in the Michigan Symphony Band formed who he was as a, as a player and as a teacher. Yeah, when I think about that and think about the fact that I now get to go there and help build and perpetuate that legacy, it seems almost too good to be true. I, that was the first and thing honestly, that no. came to mind. I was like, oh my gosh, he's going where... All our teachers went, I just, I, unbelievable. Yeah. Isn't it poetic? I mean, and, and for, for me to have my education career, my career as a teacher sidetracked, if you could, if you can permit me to say that by my Marine band career to come full circle and to have a chance to pay it back now to the very roots of, of the kind of musician that I became because of my teachers who, who had an affiliation with the university. It's, it's amazing. It is such, I, I could not have planned it any better and of course I, I would never have been able to um, but to answer your question you know I knew that that Professor Haithcock was retiring I knew that it would be an amazing place to be in fact if you had asked me if where would I like to go after my time as director of the Marine Band whether a job was available or not 10 times out of 10 I would have said the University of Michigan because of that legacy because of that history because of our connection through our teachers and because it's so similar in many ways to the Marine Band, I mean, the, the way that the band is structured, the artistic identity has, there's been parallels all along the 20th century and 21st century with the band. So it just felt like home. But I was also under no illusion that I would have been a top candidate to have one of the, one of the, the, the top jobs in, in our education profession, because I'm not a full-time educator. I've been a full-time professional conductor. And I'm assuming you don't have like what? all the alphabet soup that a lot of people, you know, right? I'm, you don't have a, wait, I, I don't think you may think, you, do you have a master's or a PhD or anything? Uh, I, I do have a okay. master's. I don't have a doctorate. Right. Yes. Yeah, so I have a master's in orchestral conducting, uh, but I never 
was able to get my doctorate just based on my schedule here with the Marine Band. So yeah, I was an I am an unorthodox candidate. I am not in higher ed. I, I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm a professional conductor in the band world. Now, granted, I do conduct a band that I, I hold a very unique position and I've had some very unique experiences, which has been wonderful. But every university has to figure out what's best for their curriculum and best for their students. And so that's a very subjective thing. But I thought you never win the lottery unless you play the game. So just like in the Marine Band auditioning all those years ago, I submitted an application. I was fortunate enough to be interviewed. And uh, I guess the committee really saw some potential in my unorthodox candidacy. And so I was invited to campus, felt very comfortable in front of those wonderful students and in front of uh, the committee and uh, the studio of conductors that, that I would be teaching. And I left the campus feeling like whatever happens, I am, I'm at peace. Uh, I felt like I did the best I could. I would love to bring those perspectives and experiences to Michigan. But if there's somebody else that's more qualified for what they're looking for, that's wonderful. Michigan's going to be fine either way because there's such an amazing program. And I was just elated when, for the whatever reasons they, they had, they decided to, uh, to, to take a chance on me. And so I'm thrilled to be able to, to go there and to make music at a high level like I've done for the last 25 years and to finally get back to teaching and to sharing um, some of some of what I've been so lucky to have with with uh, the next generation of conductors and, and players. Beautiful. I can't I cannot wait to see what you do there, my friend. I, I am so excited about that. I can't even tell you. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know, like say so do you know what your schedule is going to look like there? Yeah, I mean, the director of bands at a place like Michigan, a Big Ten University, has a lot of administrative responsibility, which, lucky for me, I've had quite a bit of administrative responsibility here. So that feels natural. So I'd, I'll be running the entire band program. But really what that means is allowing the talented professionals that are on faculty and staff to do their jobs. So overseeing the success of, of uh, the nine bands that are there, the 10 bands that are there, um, across the athletic department, across all the symphonic bands, um, and then uh, collaborating with uh, the faculty members that are on the band staff. And um, so I'll be doing that from an administrative perspective. I will be conducting the symphony band, as all directors of band have in the history uh, of Michigan. There have been eight. I will be the eighth director of bands versus the 28th director of the Marine Band. So a different legacy, which is fascinating. Uh, and then I will also have uh, my graduate studio. So at currently, uh, in this coming year, I'll have six graduate students, uh, four DMAs, a PhD cognate in music education, and then a master's student. And that'll be pretty much my studio for the duration of my tenure there. It'll be between four and six graduate students every year. Oh, that's great. The digital rehearsal thing that you did with, uh, with, the, with the president's own, that was stunning. I enjoyed. I've. I'd be shocked if I haven't seen every single one. I just. I, I wow. enjoyed. I enjoyed those so much. Um. What? Who? Whose idea was that? How did that come about? Well, I. For, I appreciate it, Tom. You saying so, and actually, that's been one of the wonderful surprises of my time uh, at the helm. Here is how popular and how. Um, excited people were to watch that series that series uh, it was my idea but it came about from COVID because right. i had long thought it'd be nice to kind of open our doors and show what we do in a professional band behind the scenes really to show my colleagues in the education profession how similar um some of what we try to do as teachers is i'm not teaching my colleagues but rehearsing and and going through the process of bringing something to life you know, even though the band is amazing, we still make mistakes. I make mistakes. We still play out of tune once in a while. It starts at a, a, much, a, a really high level, as you can hear, but there's always things to work on. But the thing I really wanted to communicate to people through that series was how we talk to each other, how we relate to each other, how we collaborate and build upon the strengths that everybody has as a team. You know, this idea that we can get a lot done at a very high level, but do it respectfully and do it collaboratively which is the way we work here in the Marine Band. And no one would ever know that unless we showed them that. So I, I couldn't find the right opportunity to make these videos because it was very labor intensive and getting everybody together. And then COVID happened and we needed to do something to stay engaged. And I wanted to stay engaged with the education community first. So this, this was the perfect time to launch this and to start playing together. 
And the idea of these videos was that they are not edited. The videos are like you push play on the push record on the camera and we start playing a piece for the first time, either something we've we know and we're revisiting or a brand new piece. And you are seeing the process from the ground up. And then we get done with a half an hour of work and we push stop on the camera and that's it. And that's what gets released. So there's no lipstick on this. There's no sugar coating. It is the actual process. And I wanted to try to be as real as possible. So I, I was trying not to play to the cameras. You know, of course, I talk to the cameras and give some background and and set things up. But but the actual rehearsing, I wanted that to be as, as natural and honest as it could be. In fact, after we did a couple of these episodes, we, sh- we shut the camera down and I asked the band, I said, am I acting like I normally do? <laughs> or are you getting like a, a made for TV version of Colonel Fetting? And thank goodness they said, no, you know, this is pretty much the way we talk to each other and the way we operate on a regular basis. So I was thankful because I wanted it to be honest. You know, I wanted it to feel totally natural as if you were sitting in the rehearsal room with us. And so that we kept making these videos. We kept doing every, you know, a couple times a year, we'd make a new episode and um, finding different repertoire, doing a lot of standards, the stuff that high school bands were going to be doing, colleges were going to be doing. So you could get a little bit of an example, a model for how you could work on something and, and um, one aspect or one idea of interpretation. And then some new pieces too, and to try to bring some new classics into the fold. Pieces especially the band didn't know because then it really put us in a position of starting from nothing. And I'll tell you, some of my colleagues were a little bit concerned about showing themselves in that way, you know, playing Come Sunday by Omar Thomas for the first time with having never seen it before, like literally sight reading it together and putting that out for the public to see was vulnerable. It was a little scary. It was scary for me, too, because I would make mistakes or I'd say the wrong thing or I'd hear something wrong. And I said it on camera and it was there and I wasn't going to edit it out. So but then I, I told I told my friends, I said, it's important for us to show this. You know, the finished product that they'll see two days later is impressive, too, that in two days you can make it sound that way. But I think it's important to show where we start, too, because that process is so important. And it's what binds us together as musicians across the country at all levels of ability. Ooh, I'm I'm actually glad you just said that end part too. Uh, how what is what does the rehearsal schedule look like for the for the president's band? So, because we're very similar to every other professional organization in the country, in that we only rehearse when we have a performance. So we're not getting together every day to rehearse just for the sake of rehearsing. We're very much a made-to-order organization. We have a lot of music. I mean, we're basically performing weekly. So there's a concert or a recording or some sort of event happening weekly that needs some rehearsal. Depending on what it is, dictates how much rehearsal we have. So we might do one rehearsal for a White House commitment where the music isn't quite as difficult and there's not as much of it. Whereas we might do four rehearsals for a two hour significant, you know, uh, subscription series concert that has, you know, world premieres and really difficult repertoire. Um, and then, you know, some everywhere in between, maybe two rehearsals for a summer kind of pops concert. And those rehearsals are pretty intense. I mean, like you see in the digital rehearsal hall, we get right to work. We jump right in. I try not to waste everyone's time with doing unnecessary repetition. It's about digging into the music and getting as deep as we can, as efficiently as we can, and knowing what will fix itself through the band just absorbing the music and what needs to actually be addressed and worked on and negotiated. Um, But I've loved that rehearsal process because there's no wasted time or effort, but we also can take a week's worth of rehearsals, 12 hours of rehearsal, and we can really make something special. You would think, what are you going to do with the Marine Band for 12 hours? Like that seems ridiculous that this band, you could find something to do, but there's always something to work on. There's always something where we can take it to a new level, that we can try and experiment different things. We're not always fixing things. We might just be experimenting and finding out what sounds best and what's going to give us uh, the best chance of of realizing this music the way it should be sounded. But um, but it's, it's a crazy schedule because every week is something different. And between the ceremonies we have and the White House commitments we have, many of which will go with no rehearsal, so we have a bunch of music we just know all the time that we can play, to our actual programmed concerts and recordings every week brings a new challenge. Well, I can tell you, I, uh, I love YouTube so much. I, I, it's so easy to get lost in YouTube and find like 
the old videos of, uh, you know, Fred Fennell or, or all those, it, just they're breathtaking, right? And so, so yeah. this past uh, this past spring, I conducted Nimrod from Enigma Variations, and uh, and I actually consider that to be actually deceivingly difficult to conduct, you know, because it's like. You know, part of me, you know, I want to do it. I'd love to be able to do it like as slow as like Leonard Bernstein did it, right? And, uh, but with like, you know, a wind ensemble, like we don't have that kind of air, you know, and I'm talking, and I'm talking with like non professional musicians, most of them. So there are some music educators in there, but most of them are like, you know, retired scientists and people just playing their instruments that live on Cape Cod. So then I, I watched, watched your conducting of Nimrod on there. I just, outstanding and I loved I loved that I could look at like and I finally like I don't even remember who's I was like you know what that's the one I can do it a little bit faster so it's really in three I'm not subdividing everything you know so anyways uh, I don't know it just sticks out in my head that I just love being able to use YouTube as a resource and now you've created a resource for all those other wonderful pieces uh, which is so outstanding so Kudos to well, you. I, I appreciate I appreciate that very much, Tom. You know, I, nothing gives me greater pleasure than to know that all of the concerts and tapes and specials that we make here are being used by musicians all over the globe, that they're listening to them, that they maybe provide some inspiration, provide a model. Um, that's why we do it. And, you know, sending it out into the ether and having not knowing if anybody cares is the worst thing for any of us as musicians to do. Like we perform for people. We want to share. That's the whole point. It's interesting you brought up that performance. I want to tell you a little story that actually I've never told anybody before outside of the organization. That performance of Nimrod by the band that's on YouTube was from a live concert, a summer concert. And what people don't know is that my mom passed away that day. So I was with her in the morning and she passed away after a brief battle with cancer. And I came back and I had a concert scheduled that night and I wasn't going to cancel the concert. I was going to go to work and do my job. And Nimrod just happened to be on that program. And so as we're performing that, of course, I'm thinking about my mom. And it became a really, really personal moment for me. So whatever tempos and phrasing I had there was about as honest as you can imagine uh, and I'll never forget that performance because of how meaningful it was to me. And no one knew the band didn't even know at that time. I only told them later or they found out later because mm. it really it didn't need to be anything we shared. Yep. Uh, and I haven't watched it since that because I don't know if I can. You know, that's that's just going to be there forever. Well, but... I watched it about 5000 times for you. So it's breathtakingly beautiful. So thank <laughs> yeah. you. I taught high school for eight years, but now I teach fifth and sixth grade band. And I just want to know, like I find myself, I'm very guilty of, I catch myself and I'm conducting bigger and I'm, or I'm just being like, just only I'm conducting the beat and it's very strong and it's just, oh, I got to keep these kids together no, no matter what. And I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions for um, music educators out there and their conducting and. Yeah, the first thing I want to say is I don't want to be presumptuous about what it takes to do that amazing work in the classroom, especially at uh, fifth, sixth grade band, middle school band. Uh, It's such important teaching. It's such a formative time for these students as musicians, as people, and teachers like you, Tom, that do that work are are some of the most important teachers in our in our field. Um, Because you got to motivate these kids to stay stick with it and and to give up that time that they could be spending on so many other things. And it's hard. It's hard to meet those deadlines. It's hard to get to those concerts and those benchmarks in the curriculum to keep the kids together, get them playing the music you've chosen. There's pressure to get there. And so as conductors, I think we respond to the pressure as musicians. We're like, okay, well, this has got to be together. The concert's in three days. I'm just going to conduct bigger. I'm just going to do that work for them. I'm going to beat time for them and hope that we can get to the end of the piece. And while that may be a good short-term solution to accomplishing that goal. I think long-term, there's a lot of music that can get missed, not only for the kids, but also for us as the directors and the conductors. 
And so when I have had a chance, even though I'm not in the classroom and don't have to do that work every day, that's so difficult. When I've taught in com- conductor symposium and I've met with middle school band directors, especially and high school band directors, and I've seen some of the results of that kind of teaching that's necessitated a certain kind of conducting that's maybe not their most musical work. I've tried to encourage them to build into their curriculum a, a chance to give more autonomy to the students, to insist on that autonomy, that internal musicianship that allows them to take ownership of the time, allows them to take ownership of some of those things that we often feel like we've got to dictate or we've got to control. Because the, 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 the bottom line is, Tom, you know, we can't control anything. This makes no sound. So at the end of the day, whether we conduct, you know, the largest thing we can possibly imagine to get their attention or we conduct more subtly, at the end of the day, they're, they're going to control that music. The ensemble is going to have the power to keep that together or not. So why not give that to them? Why not insist that that's part of the teaching? And then what ends up happening, and this goes to the higher levels of collegiate conducting and high school conducting too, which is once we stop beating them over the head with our conducting, then they stop tuning us out. Because I think at a certain point, we get so in their business, whether it's a college band or a, or a middle school band, that they just start to ignore it because it becomes white noise. We're at our most effective as conductors at every level when whatever we do has impact and that there's, there's a collaboration between the autonomy of the ensemble, the ensemble taking responsibility for some of their musicianship, and then us guiding them and catching their attention to add on top of that. And I think for, for somebody like you who's doing that work with fifth and sixth grade band, first, the first step is to choose the right music. Choose the music that you know is within their capabilities, but has just enough challenge and opportunity for you to add something new to their palette, add something new to their toolbox, and then to teach it in a way that right, right from day one puts the autonomy in their hands and, and, and shows them that they can make this music and that you don't even need to be there. What would happen if you started that tune and you just walked off the podium? Would they freak out? Would they find a way to make it their own? And then if it works, which oftentimes, by the way, it does when you get to a certain point, then that tells you everything you need to know as a teacher and a conductor about what you need to do and what you should do and what you want to do. And then a whole new level of musicianship, I think, can emerge for that ensemble. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's definitely, I'm always amazed. Hey, guys, I'm going to go get a quick recording of this so I can put it up on a little Facebook page. And hey, come listen to this concert. They don't need me. <laughs> it's like the old Seinfeld, you know, the old Seinfeld joke. The conductor just starts, he can leave and then come back later, you know, whatever. Some yeah. stupid thing he used to say. Um, but, where, but where they do need you, Tom, is they need you for the spontaneity. They need you for the, the moment where at the dress rehearsal or the concert is a little bit different than what you've rehearsed. And when they realize that they changed it on the fly because they were in control of so much of it that they could pay attention to you. That's a light bulb moment for a young musician because then it became a thing that happened in real time. It wasn't just regurgitating what you had drilled for a month or two. It was a new live experience, which is what music's all about. It's a living experience in the moment. Yeah. I actually did this for the first time in a long time. Like I, I used to do it a little bit in college during conducting classes with Ral and Amber Crombie and all those guys. But uh, actually, I had Professor Steele, too. I actually enjoyed him. Um I did it because I was really, there was something and I just didn't like, it was for my adult group and I didn't like how the group was sounding. And to me, whenever there's a collective group, it's probably me, right? So it would be one thing if it was just like a couple people, you're not good at staying together. No, it's probably me. So like, uh, it was like in slow six, this piece. And so I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to get in front of a mirror. And I, man, is that ever enlightening right or like put a video camera on yourself you probably like look at yourself on those uh yeah. on those youtube things and go oh wow look at that i didn't know i looked like that or maybe you do because you practice in front of a mirror i don't know I, i'm just curious sometimes i i don't practice in front of a mirror because i think the feedback is not as helpful when there's not actual live music happening with you it's almost like conducting to a recording you can get it to work 
but you're not actually leading anything. You're just, you're following the recording, right? So from a gestural standpoint of, of just kind of figuring out how your body works, it's good to look in the mirror to see kind of how the joints are moving just in a fundamental level. But videotaping myself in front of live musicians is the most helpful information for the connection to the music. And I will tell you, even after all these years, 25 years of conducting here, I still watch videotape every day because we videotape every rehearsal. As a matter of course, there are six cameras in our rehearsal space, which are not only used for the digital rehearsal hall, they're also used for every rehearsal so that the directors can go back to their office after the rehearsal and look at it and find out why it went wrong and find out that 90% of the time it went wrong because of something we were doing. So I'm not as surprised when I will come across a video of me on YouTube because I'm watching some of that feedback every day and trying to bring that to the next rehearsal. It is very humbling. It gets a little bit better over the years when you know that you're improving and know that you have the capacity to fix some of the things that are problems in your conducting. But it's like hearing your own voice on a on a voicemail. It's still disconcerting to watch yourself conduct because there's things that I naturally do that just bug me and they're just part of my body. They're just part of my style and they're not really going to change, nor do they necessarily need to change, just like you can't change your voice. I just don't like watching them. <laughs> but it is, it is a, a critical, critical aspect of any serious conductor to watch themselves from the third person perspective, from, from a video camera where you're watching not only what you're doing from from a, from a, an audience perspective, but you're also watching how it connects with what the sounds that are coming back. Because that's really the most important thing is what are you doing physically? Even if you don't like the way it looks, if it's effective, that's the key. Did it get the sound out of the ensemble you wanted? Did it have the time that you needed? That's the most important thing. Conversely, you could look beautiful or you could think that what you did was just so elegant and so like a ballet dancer. But if the band sounded like crap, it's not useful. <laughs> so finding the, the middle ground in those two worlds is critical. Do you generally like the way you look? Does it feel organic and natural? And does it make the band sound good? Once you get to that point, more often than not, then you're really making some progress as a conductor. What are some of the top couple concerts you've ever seen? That I've ever seen, yeah. uh, not participated in? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, I, I once heard Mozart's Grand Partita conducted by Simon Rattle at Carnegie Hall. That was a life-changing experience. Uh, I'm going to go see uh, Bruce Springsteen in about a month for the first time live, and I'm excited about yeah, that. That's That's great. Yeah. One of the things that I've always uh, prided myself on is having a fairly wide taste in music and really enjoying all different kinds of music, which has kept me grounded, made sure that I'm, I'm not an elitist musician who believes that some music is better than others. And that's been really valuable in this career because we play so many different kinds of music for so many different people that I could go hear the Berlin Philharmonic. I could go hear the New York Philharmonic, which um, that was another concert recently that I heard. I heard the first concert in the, uh, the renovated Avery Fisher Hall and uh, heard um, Sibelius II, which was marvelous. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning piece by uh, Taya Leon, uh, which was amazing. Tanya Leon, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, but then to go to a rock concert and find as much value in the way that that music lights people up and the connection and community that you see at a Bruce Springsteen concert or a Billy Joel concert or a Rush concert, that's as valuable as a performer as watching a great orchestra because we're all trying to do the same thing, which is to touch people and to move them and to make a connection across the stage. And I, I've been really grateful to be here in the Marine Band because that's all we do. Our entire mission is to connect people and connect communities and connect countries and find a way to use music to help people feel more similar to each other than they are different and to help share cultures and share different perspectives and personalities and to value each other's music and each other's perspective. It sounds trite and cliche when you just say it out loud, but for the last quarter of a century, I've seen it work in real time every single day. And if I had ended up in another aspect of our field where I didn't feel that as much, I think I would have gotten burned out a long time ago. 
But I feel as energized about music making today as I, I did when I first came here because I've seen how much it matters. And I've seen how many different ways it can matter to a lot of different kinds of people who have a lot of different kind of musical musical taste. And um, my my embrace of all of those different styles has only grown over the years because I can see how important it is to people. Yeah, that's that's really good that, that you say that. I mean, I have so many young students, you know, and I have the young sporty kids. And I have, you know, I have the quiet kids. I have the kids that are really gung-ho musicians at fifth and sixth grade. But I, I love them all, and I try to connect with each student. And part of the reason I do that is because I conduct – I have two adult ensembles that I conduct. And I love conducting those adult ensembles. One, one of them has a bunch of music educators in it, and one of them has just a, a few. But, you know, the one, my summer band, which is just like a town community band, but it's 70 people large. It's, it's a great band. But I love it because – there's, you know, we have, in Falmouth, we have the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. So half, you know, not half the band, a th- quarter of the band either works there or has worked at Huey. And so they're just scientists that also play their instrument or they're teachers, but they teach science or they're lawyers or they're doctors. Uh, our tuba player is literally a brain surgeon middle of a concert he gets a beep oh gotta go <laughs> like mid tune see i gotta go okay that's a bummer <laughs> you know but uh you know it's i love doing that because those people those people look forward to making music together and we get these nice audiences and i would like to think if you're an audience member and you're going to a concert band concert outside on a thursday night you will probably touch by music at some point during your life to appreciate that type of music and not just only listen to pop music or whatever, you know? So, um, you know, that's uh, similar. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I love these stories and I love that all these ensembles exist across the country because these are people who are making an effort to be there. They want to be involved in that music making in that community they want to create with each other they want to share it with audiences audiences show up because they want to hear that not only do they want to hear that music they want to see that community they want to see that passion and that impulse toward making an effort to share it and this is what's beautiful i mean we're we're here for so little time as humans and what are we here for other than to actually share experiences together i mean who wants to live as a hermit alone doing your own thing as a musician in a practice room playing only by yourself the whole time, that's maddening and drive you crazy. We want to do things together. We want to impact each other and music is a perfect vehicle for that. And the, the, all the evidence you need is your bands and the fact that people show up without being paid to come and have an experience together and, and put in your hands their trust that you're going to pick music that that's going to speak to them, that you're going to lead and rehearse them in a way that's going to help them feel good about themselves and feel good about what each other's doing. And a lot of that comes from what's happening in your classroom. You're, you're teaching these kids instruments and teaching about music and only a handful of them are going to go on to do it professionally. But those same kids that you're teaching that, that all of your listeners are teaching in middle school and through high school and even through college are going to be the ones that end up in those bands as adults, as engineers, as scientists, as authors, as actors, whatever, plumbers. And they're going to be the ones that go to those concerts and they're going to remember how they felt when they were in sixth grade in that concert they had and that achievement. And that's why they keep coming back. And that's why music will always be here and that's you know it's such an amazing thing to take stock of and it means that everything that we're doing in this field matters at every single level it matters toward keeping this art afloat for the next thousand years so now i'm going to switch gears to two or three most memorable performances either as a player or conductor or whatever Boy, I've got a lot you can imagine, Tom. Um, as a player in my three and a half years, uh, I remember um, I remember my lasts. I, mean, I remember my first and my last. My very first performance with the Marine Band was um, with Leonard Slotkin conducting, which is amazing. That I got got into my first professional ensemble, and I've got this famous conductor conducting me like right out of the gate. 
And then my last couple of performances before I started conducting were um, I did a, a I had a solo performance with the orchestra where I did uh, Gnarly Buttons by John Adams, which was one of the hardest things I'd ever played. And that felt like a really great accomplishment um, to get through that uh, as one of my final performances. And then my very final performance before I started conducting was uh, in Switzerland. So we went to Switzerland in 2001 and I was uh, in the clarinet section and I was part of a a small solo clarinet section that played the world premiere of a piece by David Rakowski called Ten of a Kind, which was a symphony for wind ensemble and clarinet section. So I got to play one of the solo parts in Switzerland. And the cool thing about that is the very next time we went to International, which is which was in 2019, um, and that was when I took the band to Japan. And then I also got to take the band to Europe last summer too. So it's so hard for us to, to take international trips because it's so expensive and difficult to plan. So my last performance as a clarinet player was our last international trip, and my last some of my last performances as director were international as well. And those were some other memorable occasions. Being in Prague last summer and playing Music for Prague by Carol Husa for the Prague people while Russia is doing what Russia is doing in Ukraine so close after what they did to the Czech Republic back in the uh, middle part of the 20th century – that was a really, really moving concert experience that I'll never forget. Another moment where you think, gosh, music really matters. And to have such an angular, angry, difficult piece like Prague, it's not exactly a, a, a rousing patriotic number, right? It's really emotional and it's really thorny. But they just went nuts because of what it represented in that international relationship between the, the Czech people and the Americans. Uh, one of my most memorable concerts was just a few weeks ago, Tom, where John Williams came back and conducted the band, but he's 91, and so he only conducted a half, and I had the privilege of conducting the first half with Maestro Williams looking over my shoulder, oh basically, my as we conducted all of his music. But to be there in the Kennedy Center and to conduct that amazing music for the maestro himself and to spend a couple of days with him and, and really to feel like he's a friend at this point is just surreal after growing up just revering his music and his conducting and what he meant to American music and to have that come to where it's a part of my, my regular artistic life is, is incredible. The memories I have um, span a lot of different areas. Those are the concert memories that have been so incredible being a part of a great concert ensemble. But we're also at the White House, you know, over 300 times a year. I mean, I've performed at the White House probably, you know, 500, 600 times during my career um, as a conductor, as a player, and just rubbing elbows with some of the people that happen there, that we happen to come across there is amazing. You know, to, to look down playing a Bach piece and have Yo-Yo Ma have snuck into the orchestra and taken somebody's cello and be playing right under my nose was such a surprise. One time, Meryl Streep came to the White House, and we had organized a whole medley of some of her love themes from her movies that we thought maybe somewhere in the event we would play it and she might hear it and come over. Well, she showed up early, and we were warming up in the grand foyer of the White House, and she showed up and stood right there next to the orchestra, and we were just sitting there. And I looked at the orchestra, and I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. We have to play a private concert for Meryl Streep. So we pulled out this medley you know, started with Sophie's Choice and she recognized it right away. She started crying and it was a private, literally a private concert, Tom, for Meryl Streep. Ten minutes of her, her her most famous movie medley. She came over, gave me a hug afterwards, said how much it meant to her. And I, I've told this story before because it, she wasn't a celebrity at that time. She was a human being who was having an emotional experience through music with us and a private one. No cameras, no press, no president. And it, it was just such a cool thing to take in in the moment that it felt totally normal, totally human, not nerve wracking at all to be in the presence of famous people because it's about just a human connection. Another human connection that I'll never forget is performing for George W. Uh, H.W. Bush's state funeral. You know, we play for the president all the time. I've met, you know, five presidents now. I, I know, played at the White House so many times, but honoring a former commander in chief in that very personal national moment where all the former presidents are in the national cathedral all these people are there to to mourn in their in the case of president bush their father he gave the eulogy and i remember performing um 
the Eternal Father, which is the Navy hymn. We were performing a version for orchestra and full chorus in the National Cathedral, and he was in the Navy, served his country in World War II. I remember how emotional I felt just hearing this music ringing out into the National Cathedral, knowing who was listening to it, knowing what the event was, knowing how important it was for our country, and how serious of an event was someone had passed away, you know, much like the story I told about my mom earlier. There's nothing more emotional than losing someone who meant so much to your family, meant so much to the country in this case, and to be able to p- provide the soundtrack for that moment in time was incredibly moving. I will never forget how I felt just having the privilege to be there, let alone to conduct that moment and lead those musicians through that that uh, that music. It was incredible. All right. Well, lastly... Um... And you sort of answered this a little bit, but I, I'm I'm a little bit curious. You're in the car. How what, you have a commute to home? Do you like how how long is your commute? Uh, it can be uh, in Washington D.C. I leave at six o'clock in the morning, and it takes me twenty minutes. When I go home around this time, four thirty, it takes me about an hour and All ten right, minutes. So you have plenty of time in the car. What are you listening to? Yeah. Well, this is a common question, and my son berates me all the time that I don't have a great Spotify collection. So, because I, I kind of like to leave things to chance a little bit, I'm not somebody who wants to curate, you know, my my thirty or forty selections. Even though that probably would make sense, because then I'd get a little bit of everything. But I, you know, there's two different kinds of listening I do. I do a lot of listening to the music that we perform, and I love to get into different interpretations and and performances of both the orchestra and the band music we perform. I'm somebody who gets a real kick out of out of the way that other groups and other conductors play this great music, and I never get enough of the music that we do for a living. Yep, I'm um, right there with you. I on love that going one. to concerts. Yeah, I mean, I'm not one of these guys who like leaves work at home and never listens to a Mahler symphony or never listens to a whole suite or Granger. No, I want to listen to it even when I'm not conducting. In fact, sometimes I want to listen to it more when I don't have to, to do it so I can just enjoy it. But if I'm just letting my hair down, which is hard for me these days, <laughs> um, I am a nostalgic guy and I'm nostalgic about symphonic music and some of the stuff we played at UMass and some of the stuff I played in high school for the first time and heard for the first time. I, I still get the same feelings about that when I conduct it. But I'm also a a child of the 80s, man. And so I will put on classic rewind on Sirius or put on classic vinyl and listen to the 70s and 80s. Anything from classic rock and Queen and Credence and uh, The Doors and Pink Floyd all the way up to the hair bands. I don't mind a little Poison and Motley Crue. Um, anything up to that era, uh, it just, it makes us, it puts a huge smile on my face. And so I can't get enough of it. Um, my kids think it's insane that I know the words to every Billy Joel song that was ever, uh, written. And there's a lot of hits. Um, and then, you know, if, when I get bored and when I want to think about a major transition period of my life, which was getting into the Marine band in 1997, I'll throw on some 90s and remember all those tunes I listened to when I was commuting back and forth from my student teaching days and the tunes I was listening to when I drove down to Washington, D.C. for the very first time to take on my new job that would then lead to a career. I just love how music helps you relive those places in your life that that bring you happiness and remember the people you're with and remember, you know, in many ways, how you got to where we got to today. My wife makes fun of me because I'm constantly humming or drumming, I'll get a tune in my head and I'll just sing it over and over and over again because I love the way it feels. I just love having music around me and kind of vibrating in me all the time. I think it's just the way I was made. So it's a darn good thing I ended up in this profession, I guess. <laughs> well, hey, man, thanks so much for taking the time and coming on. And uh, I mean, between your popularity and mine, we're going to have like tens of listeners. <laughs> it's going to be incredible. <laughs> All right, Tom, it is, I mean, we've known each other for a long time. We came up together in our formative years and we had some good times uh, cutting our teeth and learning how to be musicians and teachers. And uh, it's great to see all the success you've had too. I'm grateful for all the teaching you've done over the years and, and the groups you work with. And uh, it's great to see you as well. We got we to gotta get together in person sometime oh, soon. Oh, that would be amazing. Thanks, man.
Thanks for listening to the Everything Music Ed podcast. Be sure to check out future episodes as we talk to other educators from different teaching environments and cover areas of instruction such as concert band, jazz band, marching band, chorus, orchestra, general music, music tech, special needs, and much more. The theme music for the Everything Music Ed podcast is Jig, composed and arranged by Wally Minko. Jig is performed by Wayne Bergeron and can be found on his album, Full Circle. The Everything Music Ed podcast logo was created by Sarah Goulart. Thank you.